we're going to make this shift from first, from you know, traditional to second generation intelligence tests, what would we need to do? Well, this is the question that I discussed with my friend J.P. Das in 1984 when we first met to, dis to talk about how we could reinvent the concept of intelligence as a neurocognitive process. And we began the development of the cognitive assessment system. There we are, 1984, um, in our first meeting in uh, Tucson, Arizona. We conceptualized intelligence or basic psychological processes or abilities or whatever term you want to use as planning attention, simultaneous and successive neurocognitive processes based on Luria's concept of brain function. Brain function is what we're going to discuss. Here's what we looked like when we published in 97, the first edition of the CAS. And here's what we looked like shortly after we published the second edition. You can see we got a little bit older, <laughs> obviously. Um, JP is actually 19 years older than me and uh, still a wonderful, extraordinary, um, brilliant, and kind human being. We've uh, obviously been friends for a really long time. So let me tell you about the past neurocognitive theory. Sounds sophisticated neurocognitive theory, but look at the definitions. Planning is the first part of the past theory. Thinking about how you do what you decide to do. Attention, being alert and resisting distractions. Simultaneous, getting the big picture. Successive processing, following a sequence. Pass equals basic psychological processes as described in the IDEA law. But notice something. There's no psychobabble here. You can explain these four abilities to anybody. This is a strength of the past theory. Despite the fact that it's incredibly sophisticated and powerful, it's easy to explain. You don't have to have some kind of fancy words or fancy terms to describe things. It's clear. You know, I've explained this to eight-year-olds Seven-year-old, our granddaughter, six-year-old, we talked to her about planning. And remember, you want to be able to explain it to students, because ultimately, that's your most important person to tell. If you want to read about all the neuropsychological stuff, you can read these two chapters out of these books on my website, Tulio Otero, and I um, put these together if you really want to get into neuropsych. But let's, um, let's start by just reviewing Luria's conceptualization of three functional units in brain, in, of the brain. First functional unit is the base of the brain. That's for attention, resistance, and distraction. The second functional unit, the back part of the brain, that's for occipital parietal, for simultaneous, temporal, for successive, and then the front part of the brain, of course, that's what we call planning. We also think of it as executive function, metacognition, similar words, similar descriptions. So let's talk about each of these processes turn here. Planning. So planning is a term that describes a neurocognitive function, as I said, similar related to metacognition or executive functioning. Um, it's used when you have to set a goal, make decisions. When you're wondering what's gonna happen next, or what will somebody else do? It's also very much related to impulse control, strategy use. And you know, sometimes retrieval of knowledge is a really good strategy. So you might be thinking, that sounds like ADHD kids. Well, yeah, it is. And we'll take a look at that in a little while. In simple terms, this is what helps us make decisions 
about how to solve any kind of a problem. And we often think of solving problems at school, but it's more than just school. It's outside of school. It's social, social emotional. I actually like, instead of social emotional learning or social emotional competence, I like to talk about social emotional cognition. Because social emotional behaviors, if you will, are an expression of cognition. And of course, academics and lots of it. So how do you measure planning? Well, what you do is you give a student a relatively easy task and see if they spontaneously on their own decide to use a strategy. Because strategy use is evidence of thinking about how you're going to do what you do. So Jack Jr., who is now 30, um, when, he, when I gave him this very simple little task, I explained to him that he had to put XO under the A's and OO under the B's, and XX under the C's. And I said to him, you can, after I explained the task, I showed it to him, he said, you can do it any way you want. So he did the A's, then he did the B's, and then he started the C's. So I just stopped him because clearly, remember, this wasn't a, full, a real test, it was just the illustration, but to show that he was thinking strategically. And that's what we want to get at with all the planning tests on the CAS. And we have a CAS 2 rating scale for teachers. And the reason I like to show this is because these are the kind of behaviors that teachers can observe that help the teacher get a sense of is the child, where is the child on these four basic psychological processes. But by the way, it also teaches the teachers about what PASS is. But if you look at some of the questions, like have many ideas about how to do things. Solve a problem with a new solution when the old one doesn't work. These kind of behaviors are related to planning. Now, I'm going to show you two really important videos here. The first is our granddaughter, Samantha. Now she's nine years old, but here she was only 13 months old and she could not, she was not speaking and she couldn't walk unless she held on to something. So I'm sitting in the foreground here and watch how she, I say to her, come to me, Samantha, watch how she does it. Now, you might have noticed that she was planning, but let's look at it one more time. Look where she let go of the table. She was anticipating what was going to happen next. And she realized she couldn't just walk to me. So she anticipates what's gonna happen and she gets down and crawls and comes to me. In the next video here, now my, she's older and my, my daughter Andrea now is using her planning and saying, I'm afraid Samantha is gonna think she can just walk down the steps and fall. So what she does, my daughter, is help, is teach Samantha to go down on her belly feet first. So here she is, she's at the top of the 14 steps and she's coming around and, okay, she hit something, I'm, I'm encouraging her, come on, you can do it. And she's, she's looking around, she looks all the way down. I'm sure she's saying to herself, maybe this isn't such a good idea, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but she doesn't start to cry. She doesn't lose her emotional control. She's trying to stay, you know, more or less, so she doesn't roll down the log, but she's looking. She's looking around, she's coming down, she comes all the way down, and then eventually she gets down to the bottom. So this is the intersection of knowledge and planning. And this is very, very important concept um, that I, I, I evolved from um, some of the work of Nick Goldberg in his, in his book on executive function. Whenever we're in a novel situation, like our world today. Everything's different, right? Well, that's when 
PASS, but especially planning, becomes really important. Because we can't just do things based upon knowing how to do things, because now we have to learn all kinds of new things. How do you really use Zoom? Um, what do you do if people can't you know, hear the audio? Blah, blah, blah. You know? uh, do you keep going or do you try to fix it? You know, everything's new. And um, once a task is learned, then there's not as much processing involved. So if you think about what we call fluency, fluency is when you do it without really thinking. Learning is when you only can do it by thinking. When you start to learn something new, that's when PASS is really important. If you have a weakness in one of those four areas, and if the instruction particularly demands one of those four areas, you will have trouble. So if you're not good in successive processing, working things in sequence, and you're being taught reading with a phonics approach. When you, when you need to use your brain the most and you don't have any knowledge about reading, it's gonna be really hard. Okay, let's take a few more steps. Any kind of strategy use that involves planning. And there's a lot of really um, good instruction that involves strategy use, but unfortunately, teachers I don't think understand the value of explaining to students about strategies in general. Because we really don't want to teach a strategy. We want to encourage the use of strategies, especially those the students think of themselves, because those will generalize more. So let's talk about um, attention next. So attention is a basic psychological process that we use to selectively attend to some stimuli and ignores ignoring others. So focus and resist, focus and resist. You can call it selective attention. It's harder over time. The more you have to concentrate, the harder it gets. Just think about when you're driving in a car. After a while, it gets hard to focus your attention. And of course, resistance to distraction. So if you're, um, I'm often reminded of when my, my three kids were young and we were driving for a long period of time and the kids are, you know, and the music, Little Mermaid's playing for the girls and, and there's cars all around. It's really hard to focus on the road and resist this distraction. That's, that's a real life example of attention in, that, you know, in the real world. But also things like listening as opposed to hearing. And you can hear, but not really listening. Um, all those kinds of things. Now, one way that we can measure attention is with this very traditional Stroop test. Why Stroop? Because in this example, where you see this word red, but you have to say yellow, red is more salient if you read, then the color. So it creates a conflict. And it's that conflict, it's really at the point of expression. That's why we call this test on the cast to expressive attention. Because that's the point when it's really hard to figure out what you want to say. Now, in these versions of the test, in the Italian version and in the Korean version, these are really easy for us because the stimuli have lost their two dimensionality. It's just swiggly lines and color. It's easy to say blue, green, yellow, and so on. The cognitive demands of the task change as the context, in this case, the knowledge required changes. So for the attention scale, we ask the teachers, does the child work well in a noisy environment? Can they stay on task and listen carefully? Pay attention. Um, by the way, multiple choice tests are really hard if you have the inattentive type of ADHD. Those individuals do perform poorly explicitly on the attention scale on the CAS. 
And why are multiple choice questions so hard? Because the answers are so similar, right? Look, 6.22 a.m., 5.22 p.m., 6.22 p.m. So the, the difference between the correct answer, D, and the first one you see, A, is just that D has the p.m. and A has the a.m. So if you ever have a, a child with inattentive type of ADHD, you really got to help them with these multiple choice tests, preferably make it so they don't have to take them. That would be option, uh, the best option. Okay, let's look at successive processing now. This is um, all about sequencing. Recall of anything in order, words, letter, word correspondence, any kind of phonics, phonological tasks. You know, lots of times people say, well, the child has a learning disability because they have a phonological awareness um, weakness. That's why they have dyslexia. And my response to that is no. The failure of a task of phonological knowledge is because they can't sequence. Phonological is the symptom, not the cause. That's why if you have kids with dyslexia and you try to teach them all the, you know, all the phonics stuff, that's not going to help because their problem is sequencing of sounds, not phonological piece. Steve Pfeiffer and I have written a lot about this topic. You can measure that with simple recall of numbers, pretty straightforward. And we have this really totally awesome subtest that I, I think is the greatest. We want to get at syntax because syntax demands sequencing and that's what successor processing is all about. So we have for the little kids a sentence repetition, which, which is really funny because it has just weird words. So we say to the child, the red, green, the blue with the yellow. And the child has to repeat that perfectly for credit. So it's all about the syntax. But for the, the eight-year-olds and above, we do this. The red, green, the blue with a yellow. Who got greened? So now you really have to decipher the sequence of the, the syntax of the sentence in order to arrive at the answer. Now, we don't use a real sentence like, the boy hit the girl with a stick, who got hurt? Because when you hear that, that's easier to pull together as a whole. So that's a powerful successive processing test. And successive processing on the rating scale gets at sounding out hard words, um, repeating long, words, repeat sentences, and so on. All right. By the way, handwriting, very much related to successive processing. Um, uh, a colleague of mine called me about um, this young man who was in an alternative high school, actually in uh, Denver, not far from where you all are. And um, sh she just asked me if we could understand this horrible penmanship from past theory. And I said, yes. And then she said, well, you know what? We have cast scores on this boy. And look, young man, I should say, 90 in planning, 93 simultaneous, 103 attention, 55 standard score, successive process. Remember, this is a mean of 100 and SD of 15. This is a young adult with a tremendous learning disability and it showed up in his handwriting and other things. All right, finally, um, simultaneous, getting the big picture. Like I said to you before, we wanna get the big picture here. Um, integration of information to, into a whole, where everything has to be related to everything else. Like Gestalt, and remember when you learned Gestalt psychology? That's really all about simultaneous processing seeing patterns, seeing relationships, patterns in geometry, patterns in words, verbal concepts, all that kind of stuff. We have an awesome um, verbal spatial relations test, we call it. So the, the question is, which picture shows the boy behind a girl? So what's going on with that? You have to 
decipher the relationships of those people in space. That's what makes this so simultaneous processing dense. And the rating scale gets at things um, like likes to draw designs, works well with patterns, physical objects, and so on. Recognizes faces easily. But I want to show you something really interesting now, because I want to share this, come back to this notion of thinking versus knowing. So the item on the left, the progressive matrix, I mean, this demands simultaneous processing. This is one like one of the subtests on the cognoscence system and my Nagliari non trivial bundle. So you don't have to say the white circle in the top row those becomes a blue circle when, it go, when you go to the right. So a white square in the bottom left should be a blue square in the bottom right. You could say all that stuff, but you really don't have to, right? All you need to do is look at the relationships of, or the pattern to know that that's the correct answer. But how about this? Girl is to woman as boy is to man. Well, isn't that the same kind of girl is to woman as boy is to man? See that? It's really like the relationships are still there. But how about this? Three is to six as four is to age. But here's the one that illustrates how you can't think unless you have the knowledge. C7 is to F as E7 is to. If you're a musician, you know the answer is A, A major. So even though all four of these questions demand the same kind of thinking, they do not require the same amount of knowing. And that is the fundamental problem with traditional IQ tests. They're like giving you a music test and then deciding how smart you are. I do want to just briefly tell you one thing. You've probably heard a lot about visual and auditory, right? And a lot of regs, visual processing, auditory processing, and all that kind of jazz. Well, you know what? It's not how the brain works. There's a part, once the information gets processed in your brain, it loses any kind of modality tag at the heteromodal association cortex. So when someone says to you, oh, this child is good in visual, spatial, they probably mean simultaneous processing. Or when they say this student is really struggling in auditory processing, they're probably referring to a task that requires successive processing. And I've actually analyzed visual and auditory processing tests, and that's exactly what we find, the correspondence between all those different kinds of tests and these two processes. So again, one of the greatest challenges in our world today is knowing enough about a topic to think you're right, but not enough about a topic to know you're wrong. And that certainly applies to the modality concept. And I was taught modality by Rita Dunn in the 70s, who is one of the leading people in the entire modality field. All right, how do you know if a test requires thinking or knowing? It's easy. All you have to do is say, what does the student need to know to complete the task? If there's a bunch of things they have to know, it's knowledge confounded at least. How do they have to think? If they need to use a plan, if they need to focus their attention, is this distraction or see how things go together or sequence? That's basically it. 